Good morning all, a package from JLC PCB. It's printed circuit boards. Let's uh, open it up and take a look at what's in here. Haha, <laughs> another pen. And my circuit boards. Let's have a look, a closer look at those. So they're in a vacuum sealed polythene bag. They also have some silica gel in there, which uh, that seems, that's interesting if this is vacuum sealed. But anyway, I suppose if uh, some moisture got in when they were being sealed, that will have been uh, taken out. Right, let's have a really close look at these boards. So 10 of these printed circuit boards, of course, because uh, you get 10 for $2 plus the shipping charge. So it doesn't really make sense to have fewer than 10. Right, let's see what it is. Yes, it's the noise generator. It's actually a printed circuit board version of this where I was having... Um, well, it was a creative thing. I was I was able to uh, sort of circuit bend this thing, manipulate it, um, just by putting my fingers near it, sort of theremin style. So I thought, well, what about making a PCB for it with uh, a new feature, a new feature for me at least, and a copper area. So I've called this my noise generator PCB. Um, there are two connectors, that's 5 volts input, that is an audio output and I've made it 4 pins rather than 2 pins so that I can put one of these uh, connectors in, that should connect straight in there. Oh, I hope it's that way around and not that way around, that'd be interesting to find out whether I've done that right. Um, but yes, the thing that I wanted to do here particularly was put this copper area on the back and you can see that I've allocated it to the ground net so that all components that have a ground, including the ICs. Now there is an error on here. This IC doesn't actually have any spokes running to the ground from uh, the VSS pin. And that was my mistake. And I'll uh, try and explain what happened there if I can. But all the other components that uh, go to ground have spokes into this copper area so that it should make soldering rather easier. The spokes are rather large and I wanted to change the size of those, but doesn't seem that you can do that in Easy EDA. Um, I might look further into that, but I couldn't see a way of changing the spoke size. So it'd be interesting to see how um, easy or difficult it is to solder that. Now this chip does have the spoke and that's the 4030 exclusive OR gate. So this is the oscillator. So probably what I'm gonna do is build the oscillator first, which I think is just a few components down here and not put on the shift register. And just have a look at the oscillator output on the oscilloscope and move my hand near these components in particular, the 330K, a very high value resistor, 220 picofarads, very low value capacitor, and see if I can induce interference into the oscillator output. So I'll probably only partially build this circuit uh, in this video. And we'll just take a look at the oscillator output and see what it looks like. And uh, yes, looks like I was awake. I seem to have put the signal running out to the tip and the sleeve going to ground. So yes, I got that the right way around. I wasn't half asleep. I don't think I've got a 4030. I've got this 4070, which is on my PCB and it's the only one I've got. So I'm gonna have to use that. And I am gonna solder it directly in because if I put a socket in here and then sit the 4070 up on a socket, it's not really going to get the chip and its pins as close to my ground plane as I would like. So I'm going to solder that in directly and um, hope it survives that process. Yeah, this one's a pretty old corroded tarnished thing. So I might struggle a bit soldering that in, but let's give it a go. And while the soldering iron warms up, which doesn't take very long, so all I'm going to build is this, um, just the two inverters. They're exclusive OR gates, but um, with one input tied high, they behave as inverters. And these three components, I probably won't put that 100p on initially, and then I might put it on later just to see what the difference is. Look at this output, pin four. Um, this should be a square wave, I guess, shouldn't it? Digital oscillator, although it might at the frequency this is running 40 kilohertz, if indeed it is 40 kilohertz. Uh, might be a little bit non-square, but yeah, let's get that built and put it on the scope. Now, are these corroded pins going to play ball? And am I going to find the spokes? Oh, it does solder very lovely. Suck the heat out of the iron. A little bit, I guess, yes. So I could have done with slightly smaller spokes on there, but oh, this is just soldering wonderfully.
if I don't cook it or ESD it or otherwise fry it. I've got more circuit boards, I just haven't got any more of this CMOS chip. I will order some. Okay, the chip's in, let's get the other components in. So two resistors and a cap. This is not going to take very long at all. I'm using little odds and ends of solder. But how short do I tear, dare take this? Probably down to around five millimeters if I can. Let's just get these soldered on and I can fire this thing up. A little bit more solder on there. Solder's getting a little bit short though. So this is going to be nice and easy to scope because the output is pin 4. Uh, comes to this 100p which I haven't fitted. That's there. So signal is top of 100p. And ground is bottom of the 100p. I could almost put a connector in there actually and uh, scope off that. A little 2-pin connector for power. And then the 4-pin connector for output, well it can be two pins with two removed or I could put all four in, doesn't really matter does it? So I found a two pin uh, JST XH which has the 0.1 inch pitch so that fits onto my two uh, DuPont pins. I'm just going to tin those so I can put them in the uh, little press button connector there. Makes everything nice and quick to connect up. Just tin that because I don't want frayed copper wires. Oh that one's slightly got too much solder on it. Right that looks fine. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this uh, four pin female header into this socket which will be my output. Uh, for the moment I just want to put a pin in there and use that as a ground and then I can probe the clock, um, the oscillator output from this chip. So let's solder that one in. Right, I found this little two pin um, plug thing with these long pins. Don't worry that it's uh, that pitch, it doesn't really matter. The two middle pins of this connector aren't connected to anything anyway. So all I'm doing is picking off a ground, put my scope ground on there, take a look at the output. Now of course the advantage of a battery power supply is that we're not going to get any induced uh, mains artifacts if I had a, a mains bench PSU. Uh, there are no switching circuits in here of course it's a very clean uh, power supply so uh, that means we're immune from additional interference all we're going to get is interference as i move my hands close to these components which were causing quite a lot of interference on the breadboard circuit let's get on with it and there's the scope output uh, from the oscillator it's a square wave let's open that out there is a little um little kink there which is interesting. I wonder if I can get rid of that and oh, how do I change the slope? Oh I won't bother I'll just um, wheel it across a bit and there's a kink on the falling edge as well so yeah that's quite interesting those two kinks. Um, I can't really induce any interference into this. I can change the clock speed by putting my finger on that resistor. It is 330k so it's not surprising that I can uh, affect the speed of the clock. I don't seem to be seeing any interference there at all. I wonder if the ground plane really is working and stopping this being susceptible like the breadboard version was. Now looking at that little bounce spike kink, whatever it is uh, on the rising edge and putting my finger, doesn't not much happens if I put my finger near the chip, it changes a little bit or near that resistor. If I actually touch it, I can move that. If I put my finger the other side of it, I can bring it down, but then that also pulls another one down, which is slightly odd. I just wonder if some decoupling would help here. If I put a decoupling cap across that uh, chip from VDD to VSS, whether that would help. I might try that actually. And in fact, that would be quite easy to bodge wire on because there's VDD or VCC, VDD I suppose for CMOS, um, it pulls up a couple of inputs which are those unused exclusive OR inputs. One of them is pin 6 and pin 7 is ground. So if I put my decoupling cap across there, let's see if that helps any. Well let's not fly in the face of convention, let's use a 104 capacitor for that. So that's blue tacked in place uh, while I solder it. 
pin four, uh, seven, I think, isn't it, for ground? Pin seven and pin six, which just happens to have VDD on it. Okay, that looks like it's in position. Let's have a close up of that just to see that soldered across. Pin seven with the little spokes to my ground plane and pin six, which fairly rapidly goes up to pin 14, which is VDD. Well, that's made absolutely no difference whatsoever. Will it affect the susceptibility? I mean, nothing happens until I get very close to this. And you can see as I get extremely close, I can just slightly affect that pulse. Let's go back to the um, frequency. I have to actually touch it or get extremely close to it to affect the frequency now. But uh, yeah, certainly that uh, decoupling cap has made no difference to that little spike. But it all seems a lot more stable. I, I can induce quite a considerable amount of noise into this if I touch the components. But then I suppose that's not surprising. This is a very noisy room, of course, because it's got all my gadgetry in it and lots of mains. So yeah, there is some susceptibility, but I have to get a lot closer than I was getting to the breadboard. Now, what about this 100 pico farad capacitor on the output of this oscillator? I wonder if that will stabilize the output a little bit. That's the output that then goes straight into the clock input of the 18 stage shift register. So I'm just gonna solder that 100 p cap in now and see what difference that makes to the oscillator. So there she is, uh, a 101, that's 100 picofarads, and it's going to go in that hole or pair of holes right to the left of it. So with the 100 picofarad capacitor in there, it doesn't seem to have taken that spike out much. It certainly changed the slope of this uh, square wave output, which you'd expect, I suppose, of course. Actually, I didn't measure the frequency of this, did I? It's 51 kilohertz with an amplitude of 5.3 or so volts, whatever's in my battery pack, I suppose. Yeah, it's pretty fast, isn't it? I wonder if it would slow down if I powered this with the full 12 volts that the original circuit had, because the magazine article talks about this being 40 kilohertz. But uh, would it slow down at a higher voltage? Would it take longer to swing from rail to rail, or would it speed up at a higher voltage? Because there's more energy in the system. <laughs> what an interesting question. But yeah, the 100p just seems to have slightly um, sloped off this waveform a little bit and given the edges just a little bit more, well, slope. So, certainly seems that the uh, ground plane, the uh, copper area, has made this much less susceptible to interference. So I'm going to finish uh, constructing this now. Now I'm going to have to uh, sort out that problem with the VSS pin not being spoked into the ground plane. So I'll scrape a bit of the, the coating away and just solder a wire across. Let's get all the remaining components in and see whether noise comes out of the output. I'm using that tie clip I bought to hold uh, the 4006 chip completely flat to the board with its nice flat bar and its little jaws which are sitting on the other side. And I'm gonna solder it with that tie clip as a soldering aid. How good is the tie clip? Let's find out. Pretty good, I think. Oh yes, I've got to scrape the copper for pin seven, haven't I? Let's do that. Now I was gonna explain why this pin seven, which I won't solder just for the moment, um, didn't get attached to the ground plane. And that's because I used a user submitted um, library item for the 4006. There was only the one. Uh, these old CMOS chips are not very well represented in the easy EDA libraries. And it didn't have any power pins, so I had to remember to manually allocate those. And I did the uh, VCC because I think it has a track routing to it. But ground was just going to this copper area and it's not easy to spot the little spokes and I just forgot to reallocate the net. So a little bit of scraped coating there to expose the uh, bare copper. 
I'll shove a little piece of wire in there, solder it all up, and that will be connected. So, will that do for pin 7 connected to ground? I think that'll do. Yeah, this could definitely do with smaller spokes, thinner spokes, uh, running from pads out to the ground plane, because I've just soldered in this potentiometer, this trimmer pot, didn't actually have the right value, but it's near enough. It'll work as a volume control, and this one was definitely more difficult to solder, because the heat was running out through the spokes to the ground plane, uh, much more difficult to solder than these two, so spoke size control would be very nice. Right, all the resistors and capacitors are on. Just that 2N3904 transistor to go, and I went for um, a layout which has these very close together uh, pads, so no bending of the transistor needed at all. One of them is spoked onto ground, so we'll see how that solders. Let's find a 2N3904. And of course with that pad layout you get what you don't see very often which is a transistor sitting <laughs> right down on the surface of the PCB. Is that a good thing? Yeah I think it probably is. Yes of course with these pads so close together my soldering iron now feels really really big. Let's see how we get on. That one, middle one and the spoked one. Oh, not too bad, the spoked one. It didn't seem to suck all the heat out. Let's have a closer look at that. Yeah, quite tiny stuff on those three pads, but I think that has resulted in a reasonably good, in fact, a very good soldering of that transistor onto the board. Will it work? Let's find out. Is this switched on? Yes, that's switched on. So let's power up the board with my JST connector. Uh, right, speaker, where's that? It's over here. Let's connect that on. So that was the right way around. Oh, I heard a click from the speaker. So the pot is at minimum uh, amplitude or volume. Let's start turning that. Oh yeah, there's my white noise rushing sound. Let's increase the volume. Now that's interesting. Increasing the volume also seems to increase the high frequency content. I wonder if that's because of the rather crude um, circuitry here. Where's my circuit? Yeah, here it is. Which is just this very basic... Oh no, that's upside down. Uh, this very basic filter on the output. Uh, the output goes through a 10N capacitor, 15K resistor, and then through the 10K pot to ground. There's also a 33N across that pot. So would this capacitor have less effect when the pot's at maximum travel? It certainly seems to. If I turn that up, that's quite a muted noise sound. And that's quite a trebly. In fact, it almost sounds like the sea, doesn't it? It's like being by the seaside. Now of course I forgot about circuit bending so let's give that a try. Let's bring this up to half volume. Well there's a bit <laughs> but not a lot. It's much more immune to bending than the breadboard version was. Let's turn this fully up. Well, it's slightly bendable, but much less so than that one, which I've had to steal the chips off because I couldn't find any more. But yeah, all in all, I'm rather happy with my noise generator. Printed circuit board. It just works, doesn't it? That's rather good. Cheerio.